We all know that machine learning is the hottest thing to work on right now. And if you're a researcher, especially at a famous lab, startup or big tech company, you are literally at the frontier of developing the arguably biggest technology of mankind while also earning a lot of money. So with this video, I definitely don't want to talk down the ML researcher career, but I want to shed some light on what the harsh reality of being an ML researcher can look like and whether it is something for you. I mean, for context, I've been a machine learning student researcher for the past three years. I'm collaborating with a researcher at Google DeepMind, have published a paper at a top conference, and have had two papers rejected. <sighs> This last rejection was so stupid, I just have to show it to you in a second. Okay, let's directly address the elephant in the room. How likely is it that you will become an ML researcher or even an ML engineer who earns multiple 100k a year at a top company like OpenAI, Google or Meta? The short answer and harsh reality is, it is difficult. Very difficult, but not impossible. Of course, for some it is more difficult than others, mainly because of one reason that I'll get to in a second. But the long answer is, it depends on many factors, such as your experience, passion, network and of course, luck. One of the most common questions that aspiring machine learning researchers or engineers have is, do I need a PhD to get a job at a top company? The answer is, no, but it helps. A lot. Or you just need equivalent experience. Explaining how to do that without a PhD is perhaps for another video. So if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments. Anyway, a PhD is not a requirement for most ML engineering roles, but it is often a prerequisite for ML research roles, which makes sense, right? <laughs> you need research experience. Definitely, of course. But that is even more the case because machine learning research roles and some machine learning engineering roles require very domain-specific expertise and experience, which are usually acquired through years of studying and working on one particular problem. And a PhD gives you exactly this freedom, to spend three to five years focusing on one research topic and becoming a an expert in that field. A machine learning researcher, also called a research scientist, usually sits above an ML engineer in the hierarchy and earns a bit more money. So it again makes sense to expect a bit more complex machine learning problem solving experience. The ML engineer then helps realize the ideas of the researcher. That is, if the company you are working at is large enough to be able to differentiate between the two roles. But okay, that aside, all that is of course not enough. A PhD is not a guarantee of success either. I mean, I know a few PhDs and the spectrum of skill among them is very large. Some are brilliant, some are average and some are below average. You still need to prove yourself, for example by publishing papers at top conferences, collaborating with others and communicating your ideas clearly. All this is the harsh reality, but some people struggle with it more than others. I, for example, also know PhDs who are no tryhards whatsoever. And those are the actually brilliant ones. They simply love what they are doing, are super friendly and uncomplicated, and now work as researchers at Google or other amazing labs. They just enjoy the process of doing research and solving problems and enjoyed those three to five years of their PhD. You really need to love what you're doing. Only then you can continue for so long without getting any crazy compensation for a few more years. Or you're lucky to have found this passion early on in your masters or even bachelors and have managed to already produce amazing work. Again, for example, relevant personal projects, open source contributions or top published papers. The point is, it takes time. This is definitely not something that you can achieve in 6 or probably even 12 months. As mentioned, even when only considering the bachelors and masters, ignoring the PhD, people study and work for several years to get to that point. And all of this still requires a specific amount of luck, and I will get to that in a second. You can see I can barely hold myself back from sharing the story of my recently rejected paper. And I could genuinely go on for much longer. There's so much more to uncover, but let's look at the next thing no one tells you when getting into research. Let's briefly have a peek at the world of physics research. In the early days, a lot of physics research meant a person or small team sitting at a desk with pen and paper and coming up with theories that could be supported through little experiments on a single table. You did need equipment, for example fairly expensive lasers, but nothing that a university could not quite afford. Fast forward a few decades 
And to really make the slightest dent in the modern standard model of physics, you need to work at CERN, a 27 kilometer long circle tube that shoots the same particles at each other as you could do in your small lab, but with much more power. Now think of an ML researcher a few years ago. Research meant you developed ideas and tried them out with simple code, or at least simple for today's standards. One of the greatest breakthroughs in deep learning research happened back in 2015 and was a thing called the ResNet with its skip connections. I don't want to go into the details here, but essentially Essentially, the output of a neural network block was its input plus the block's output. Do you know what that meant in terms of code? You change this line of code to this one. That's it. But now, if working with large models, before being able to actually try out something new, you need to know distributed computing, hardware optimization, and how to manage large compute infrastructure, not to speak of actually getting access to that hardware. Before, you could look at lasers in your lab, but now you need to work at CERN. That is why the big companies split the roles of research scientists and ML engineers. Luckily, there are a lot of different machine learning domains to research that don't require LLMs or other super large models. To discuss them all would be out of the scope of this video, but I have a list of those machine learning domains that you can download completely for free by clicking on the link in the pinned comment. Now, depending on the person you are, you might be excited about the amount of software knowledge you need to work on machine learning research. And I, for example, also quite enjoy it. But if you are a person who wants to be a researcher because he does not want to be an engineer, then this reality might mean you need to explore a bit more and might not want to work on very large models. So, okay, you've decided you want to take on the challenge and spend the time on a master's or even better, a PhD. What does doing research really involve? What is it like and is it for you? There's one property of doing research that is exactly what people want to do and makes it exciting, but also very frustrating. In research, you're working on something new, the state of the art, something that has ideally never been done before. Now, just imagine you are starting your PhD. The beginning is always tough. You have no idea what to research. You might have a rough direction, but first need to explore your area of interest. In my case, for example, that is video language modeling, which is still a very broad direction with many different open problems. But okay, you are excited to get started and read a lot of papers on the different open problems, what the current state of the art models are doing, and what the previous ones did. This took me almost two to three months of just reading papers, thinking I had an actual idea, and then scrambling it up again until I actually came up with one that I thought might work. So at this point, I was excited to finally get started with coding and share my results. I really felt so confident and motivated and thought that this would be the work that would get me my dream job at Google DeepMind or OpenAI or whatever. I mean, that's probably something that you want as well, right? But then of course, reality hits and a bit of anxiety starts to build up. Imagine you spend months working on your idea, but you never achieve good results. You encounter technical difficulties and theoretical challenges, and your method itself seems incomplete. You realize that your hypothesis might be wrong, or even worse, irrelevant. You wonder if your research is good enough, or if you are wasting your time. You feel frustrated, discouraged, and again, anxious. This is the issue I mentioned when working on something new. It means you don't know if your idea will work or be any good. Can you imagine how stressful that can be? This is the reality of most researchers, especially PhDs who have to publish a certain amount of papers to complete their PhD. Nevertheless, you trust in the process and decide to look forward. You remind yourself that negative results are still results and that they can help you refine your research question and design. You then look for feedback from your supervisor and peers and you learn from their suggestions and criticism. You read even more literature and find new perspectives and approaches, so you update your hypothesis and try again. And guess what? You finally get some positive results. You find evidence that supports your hypothesis or that reveals something new and interesting. You eventually write a paper and want to submit it to a prestigious conference, which itself gets more stressful as the submission deadline approaches, but you feel proud and excited. Only to then again have to face the harsh reality of the review process, which often is unpredictable, random, and sometimes unfair. I, for example, recently submitted a new paper to a conference and got 
two reviews. One of the reviewers gave me and my co-authors a decent rating. Now, I have to admit, I wrote the paper a few months ago and it wasn't the best or most relevant, but in my opinion, definitely not bad. So I agreed with the first review, which still gave us an acceptance vote. But the other one gave us the lowest scores on all categories and did not even provide any further detailed feedback. I guess the reviewer had a bad day, but that obviously had a negative effect on us and is simply unacceptable. Our paper was rejected and I have to say I was upset and disappointed. There was not much that I could do. But you know, there was this amazing 2021 experiment they did at the largest AI conference called NeurIPS where they pretty much showed that 50% of the papers accepted by one committee would have been rejected by a second, different one. That means that if they swapped out the reviewers, 50% of the accepted papers would have been rejected. Well, anyway, after realizing that the review process is not perfect and that it does not always reflect the true value of your work, we looked at the positive aspects of the feedback and used it to improve our paper. We then resubmitted it to another conference and are currently waiting for the review. So I guess we could still find some comfort in knowing that we are not alone. All of this and more is the harsh reality of being or wanting to be a top earning machine learning researcher. But before you can even get to this point, you have to avoid a plethora of common beginner mistakes. So you might want to watch this video next where I share seven mistakes you might be doing already. Bye-bye.